instance, in Saco, we had a situation where we had two placeholder candidates on the ballot. Um, they withdrew after the primary, after 300 Republicans went out, fulfilled their civic duty, went down to the community center and voted, which was great. Um, the issue was when, when the candidates withdrew, uh, there was very little attention brought to the fact that they did withdraw from the race. I think there was one post on the Saco Republican Facebook page saying that they're looking for candidates, um, which that wasn't the, the big deal. I mean, that happens uh, in terms of a lack of awareness. But the problem came into where they had to hold a caucus. And they had to hold a caucus really within such a short amount of time. I think it was even 10 days. I mean, literally, uh, two, both of the candidates withdrew on, on July you know, 14th, and the deadline was July 28th. So it really didn't allow a lot of time to inform you about number one, that their candidates actually did withdraw, and number two, that they were looking for candidates, and number three, who those people were that were coming forward interested in running and being their party's nominee. Um, and so what ended up happening, what was reported by the Journal Tribune, was to me very alarming. Uh, there was no awareness of a caucus that took place in Saco to pick the Republican nominees both in both legislative districts. Why is that a problem? It's a problem because how are you supposed to participate in the electoral process if you don't know what's going on? You don't know that they were placeholder candidates. You don't know what was happening behind the scenes. And then there was no publicity around a caucus that's supposed to be enticing individuals to participate in our electoral process. I mean, we have enough trouble trying to get people to come out and vote which you would think would be a simple task, right? People literally would die in other countries around the world, and we're seeing that, and especially in places like the Middle East, that literally would die to have that right and that ability to vote. And we take it sometimes so much for granted. And so when I see any, anybody, doesn't matter what party, and I would, and I, trust me, I call out my own party for this as well, it, to see anybody trying to deny people the right to participate either directly or indirectly, that should be a major red flag for anybody. And we're seeing it in other states in terms of with voting participation, with voting ID laws, uh, ways to try to limit people's voting access. I mean, we see it consistently in other parts of the country, so we don't really expect it here. But it happens here, and it may seem like it's an indirect, inconsequential situation. Like, oh, well, they always do it. Both sides do it. And I hear this consistently, because I've gotten a lot of criticism from my own party. Justin, don't talk about this, because we all do it too. It's not really a big deal. But it should be something that you hear about and you know about. Now, why do I bring up the particular situation in Saco? Because the Journal Tribune actually covered at least the surface of what this problem is. They, I, I hope that we have continuing follow-up conversations about this. But at least they were really able to, to get some, some good quotes from individuals about how this is happening. And, and it really raised some major questions. And, and in the Journal Tribune article, um, I believe it was on July 30th, if you want to check it out, uh, they have individuals quoted, like, for instance, Daphne Warren, who was the replacement candidate for the placeholder candidate. And basically, she was supposedly chosen at a caucus around 10.30 on the day of the deadline, somewhere in Saco, the documents don't say where. Um, and the caucus secretary was a political consultant from an Augusta firm that has ties to their particular party. Seems kind of sketchy, right? Um, and then moreover, what is probably the most concerning out of that whole dynamic is that the chair of the Saco Republican Party did not even know that the caucus took place, did not know that Daphne Warren was chosen as a candidate, did not know that a caucus took place. I mean, that right there should be an alarming figure. And, and, it, and it goes on to say that Robert, let's see, Robert Zitzo uh, of the York County Republican Committee was even quoted in that same article that he even said, quote, I can't imagine a town or city committee running a caucus without the chairman present or without the express knowledge of the chairman, end quote. So it's not just me bringing this to people's attention. This is, this is sort of concerning other individuals as well. And when I have Republicans come up to me and say, 
what is going on with this? Why, why weren't we notified that there was a caucus? I mean, who knows? Maybe nobody would have come forward to replace the, the placeholder candidates. But the, 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 to me, it's about the principle. To me, it's about disenfranchising those voters. It's saying that, oh, you're sorry, your vote doesn't count in the primary election. We're not going to even be bothered to even post it on Facebook, send it out to the press. I mean, they may have only had like a week and a half to two weeks to pull this together and get the message out. But when you're already actively utilizing your website, actively updating and posting every day on Facebook, you mean to tell me you can't post one thing on either of those two mediums to let people know about the caucus? Don't give me that. Okay, that's absolutely not an excuse. Not, not, and, and it just it bothers me so much because again, we have so many issues with trying to get people to participate, and this is limiting people's access. And it, to me, it actually shows the strength of the party rather than the strength and, and the voice of the people. Because when the chair of a local party committee does not even know that the party basically put in somebody, sent one of their operatives down, put their name down, and then it just so happens that that candidate that they put down last minute is now withdrawing. So now the, the replacement to the placeholder was, I guess, according to her words, another placeholder for something I don't know because you can't replace them again, and now actually physically withdrawing from the ballot. So now there's no candidate running on the Republican side against Representative Barry Hobbins and Sacco. Now, you would think, oh, I'd get excited about that as a Democrat. But you know, what bothers me is that process point. What bothers me is that Republicans and Sacco should have been given a choice, should have been able to participate in the electoral process. Um, and, and while it may be legal, while it may be ethical from a legal standpoint that they're allowed to do it this way, not advertising it in a public format, not including the public, and only maybe, who knows, I don't know if it was in an email that they sent out to people. We have no idea. There is no information. They're not providing that information to the public, so we have no idea. But the fact of the matter is, it's not right. Whether it was on the Democratic side, and trust me, the Democrats have done it too. They do it in other communities. And what ends up happening is this happens consistently in, in, in districts, legislative districts, that happen to be safe. And what I mean by that is the parties label certain areas, whether they're more safe towards the Democrats or more safe towards the Republicans in terms of holding on to the seat. So oftentimes they view Saco as a safe district, though it's important to earn every single vote. I take no election for granted. It's important that you articulate what you want to do for people and let them make that determination. But I'm just telling you from behind the scenes, parties label certain areas safe or not safe in terms of where they put resources and put their backing. And so what ends up happening is the districts that one party views as safe, the other party may not be as actively participating or actively trying to get candidates or maybe just more difficult to get candidates. So it usually happens last minute, hey, can you just put your name down? But it's really important that the public participates. I mean, I, I really can't say it more clearly. And, and, and I could keep going with this, this article. To me, this article was fantastic in terms of really highlighting the issue. This happened to me last year, because now the Saco Republican chair is now running against me. And she put her name down on a, 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 as a part of a caucus that supposedly took place a week before Daphne Warren's caucus that took place somewhere in Saco at 10.30 on the deadline day. And we have no details about that particular caucus. Um, but. It just, to me, it's, this is something that happens every year. Last election cycle, my opponent went through the same process. But to me, this, the difference is, at least this time, at least last time, there was some notification. There was some awareness that a caucus was taking place. There was, I think there was a notice in the newspaper. I would have felt much more comfortable knowing that the, the public was invited, knowing that the public can participate, uh, regardless of party. But in this case, it was Republicans. And I want Republicans, I represent everybody as a state representative, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or Green and unenrolled, I don't care. And so when I have constituents come to me and they just happen to be Republicans and say, we're upset about this, we're feeling dis disenfranchised. I have a right and a responsibility to fight for them, to bring this to people's attention. And I know it's really easy to say, well, it, Justin, you're obviously you're bringing this up because it's your opponent. But to me, it's a process question. It's something that Democrats do. It's something that Republicans do. And it has to stop.
And, and I let it slide last time. I brought it to people's attention. I, I raised you know, some, some interesting information in the local newspaper last election back in 2012. Um, and I'm doing it again. But last time I didn't do anything legislatively because I was like, OK, well, that's the process. It's completely legal to do it. This time, this is ridiculous. And, and, and if given the chance to go back, I will be putting in legislation, working with my colleagues uh, on any side of the aisle that wants to listen to this issue, because enough is enough. We are drawing a line in the sand as a public and saying, we are not going to stand for the party to have more power than the voice of the people, period. And this really gets to a strong democratic argument that it's like, what are the parties really here for? What are they really fighting for? Are they fighting for you? Or are they just fighting because they want to just advance their own uh, cause, their own candidates, just to beef them up? This has to be about good public policy discussions. This has to be about elections being an excuse to talk about what you want, what we want as a community. That's what elections are there for, so that we can have this active and honest debate about the challenges that we face and the potential solutions that we need. And so to deny indirectly so people from participating in that conversation, uh, keeping people from their choice in terms of their, their choosing their nominee, I mean, somebody has to say something. We have to get angry about this and, ch and challenge the status quo to say this is not acceptable. And I really believe you deserve a right to know. You deserve a right to know why the, why the Republican Party switched out the candidates last minute, why they didn't notify the local chair of the Republican Party, it really uh, shafted her in terms of this whole process, because sh they should have notified her that this actually took place. And it, we should also have some answers in terms of why they felt it was necessary to shut out the public. Why did they not? post it on Facebook, put it on their website, put a notice in the newspaper. You know, obviously having a week to two weeks is not a, a lot of time. And that's built into the system. Maybe we need to change that. Maybe in the statute we need to change that we have a little bit more wiggle room and more time in terms of getting that notification. There's a lot of public hearings that happen in Augusta. We have to notify the public. We're legally obligated to notify the public. If the parties are not legally obligated to notify the public, we need to change that because they should. Uh, and you deserve a right to know what is happening behind the scenes, that it's not all kept out of the darkness. And so as a former journalist, this level of governmental accountability is critical. It may not be on the front page of the newspaper, it may not be covered in the TV, but we're talking about it here, and I'm going to bring it to your attention whether the parties like it or not. And I think it's really important that we continue this conversation. And, and as new information is presented, I'd be happy to, to, to kind of delve into that with you. Um, and if you want more information on this, I put this whole article and also some in very important questions that still need answered. I'm waiting. You know, if the Republicans want to tell me, hey, Justin, here's the answers, I am waiting. I am asking you to give the public answers. I am going to be waiting right here for you. So you want to come on the program, you want to send me an email to circulate to people, you want to tell the media, Tell somebody, because we, we deserve an answer collectively. Saco residents is Mainers that this process is not effective, it is undemocratic, and we deserve a change. So if you want to, to follow this information, this story, get all the information from it, you can visit my website at justinchanette.com. Um, sorry I'm all riled up, but you can tell how this issue just really bothers me to my core, and I'm not going to stop talking about it until it's resolved. So I hope you join with me about it. This has been Beyond the Headlines, where we delve beyond the, uh, the kind of the surface story to get to the real answers you deserve and tell people's stories in an effective and honest way. Hope to see you right back here next week. <laughs>